In fact, as we come and we're, we're preparing for our passage today, it, we have to have this understanding that the early disciples, the early apostles were constantly, Jesus was constantly making a division between this life and the next life. And they kept saying, this life ain't nothing. Remember the rope? We, we used the life rope a couple of weeks ago, and, and we worry about this much here, and that's our life on earth, but we have all of eternity out here that we're going to be spending with God. Everything that we believe about tomorrow, everything we believe about eternity affects how we think, how we act, how we believe, and how we behave today. All right. Um, as many of you know, I'm a cowboy at heart. Uh, since I was about four, I had a pair of cowboy boots. <laughs> Sorry, that's as high as it goes if you can't see it in the back. You know, where are my cowboy boots? Um, how many of you had cowboy boots when you were a kid? I mean, I think it's a rule. You, you know, if you missed out, God bless you, I'll buy you a pair of cowboy boots. Everybody's got to have a pair at some point or the other. I remember um, I was somewhere between three and four when I got my first pair that I remember. Um, how many of you had either the pointy-toed or the square-toed, kind of that brushed leather look, uh, light brown, and mine had all this inlay inside of bright orange? Four years old, and I can still tell you because they were my favorite shoes of all time. They were ever was my boots. In fact, my boots went with everything, including shorts. I'm a Florida boy. I was raised here in Florida. Man, you're going to go play outside. You put on your cowboy boots and your shorts and have at it, you know. Uh, so you know that, that I've always had that in my heart, and here I am 53 years later, and yes, you can do the math, 53 years later, and I'm still wearing boots. But I have traded in my pony for a steel horse. Uh, we had our motorcycle ride today. Um, but as I was uh, going to be riding a motorcycle, I bought my first one, you know, many, many years ago. And I just didn't even have to think I'm going to wear those big clunky boots that my motorcycle riders love. I was like, heck no, I'm getting me another pair of cowboy boots. That's what I've been doing. And I've been doing it ever since. But I was really, um, I grew up in Tampa more of the city, and so I was really kind of an urban cowboy. My uncle ran a ranch just north of here, and um, what I would do is go up on summers and uh, winter breaks and things like that, and I would ride with him, and I would... Uh, uh, what, actually, my, my job was to hang on to the horse. Uh, that, that's what my job was. My uncle told me, you're not smart enough. The horse knows more than you do. You just hang on. That's, and that's what I did. Uh, I was only off of it one time in all the times that I rode with him, and that was uh, at a gate and sugar sand, and my horse spooked, and it left without me. And uh, right into the sugar sand at the bottom at night, 98 degrees and covered in sand. It's like, seriously yucky, you know. All right. So, um, but one of the things that I learned of the tools of the trade, anybody know what this is? That was close, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I get a little excited about it. But um, one of the things that was the tools of the trade, this is an actual genuine bull whip. And uh, my uncle, um, in fact, Mike, uh, I've got a cigar up here. Why don't you come stand up here, and, and I, th I think I can, no, no, you know, you guys have seen that, uh, but no, we're not going to do that. Why? This is a tool. It is not a toy. And one of the things that my uncle taught me uh, when using this is you never hit anything thing with it. You don't hit a horse and you don't hit a cow. Why? Because the crack of this whip is so sharp, it will split leather. It will cut it in half. It will leave permanent forever marks. The only thing it's ever used for is actually for the noise. Now, my uncle could take this. Now, I, I can crack it, uh, but I have to work at it. My uncle could literally just flip it over like that and wherever he wanted it flick, it would flick, and at the end of it would be this tremendous earth-shattering crack. And now my uncle was kind of a John Wayne guy. He was about 6'2", six 6'3", six with his boots on, and he was an old game warden, and he was tough as nails. And when he cracked the whip, everybody paid attention. Cows, horses, and all the cowboys that were right near him. But it's so important that we understand that this is a tool and we don't use it on 
anything. People, animals. I actually have a lariat at home. And before he would give it to me, he gave me the instructions. This is not a play toy. It is a tool. It is serious. You can hurt somebody. And so as we're preparing for our passage today, I, I got to thinking about uh, this bullwhip. And I was thinking about, you know, as you all, we've invited you to begin, start thinking about, you know, some of the hard times that you've been through. Um, and we're going to go into some of the things that the hard times that the Apostle Paul has been through so that you can begin to see the separation of what he really believed and he lived it with his entire life. He didn't care anything about this world. He, you, you can do to me whatever you want. All I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. I will not deny him and I will not stop talking about him or telling others about him because I have seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. Do your worst. Do whatever you want to me. So to really appreciate this passage, um, I want you to think how much it might hurt if you got hit one time. One time with the crack of a whip. But listen to what Paul says himself in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. He lists some of these things. You guys don't have it, so hang on. All right. Uh, he says he was whipped not once, not twice, not three times, four times, but five times, five different times with not one but 40 what, what kind of damage do you think a whip could do on a human skin, on a bare back? How many of you would have the guts to keep preaching after the first crack? And yet he took it over and over and over. It, it almost seems like he knew something that we didn't, right? Because he's living was like, whatever, you know, as we sang the song, you know. Lord, I lay it down. I lay my, my life is nothing here on this earth compared to the treasure of being with you for all of eternity. He said he was whipped five times with 40 lashes. He was beaten with, ro with rods. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching one of those National Geographics and talking about different cultures. And that's the way. When you turned 18, you became a man. Um, two tribes would come together, and two 18-year-olds would take these cane poles, basically, uh, that had to be really flexible so that when you hit the other guy, it actually wrapped around and lacerated all the way around the ribs. And they had to prove that they were a man by laughing at the pain. And the first one who passed out, lost. The other one was celebrated by his tribe and became a victor. I want you to think about that, that just out of the pain, many times people would pass out. He was beaten three times with rods. He was stoned once. Stoning was a way of killing people back then. You took them out and, um, and to punish them. Actually, um, I've, anybody else been to Israel? You know, one of the, one of the say things is... Um, Everything here costs one dollar except rocks. Take home one. They're free because they're everywhere. But if you wanted to exact punishment on somebody, then they would stand them off to the side and everybody would get their favorite size rock. And on the count of three, they would just all take them and hit them in the face and the head and, and the torso until they were just bloody pulps. He said he was stoned once. He was shipwrecked three times. How many of you love cruises? <laughs> you may want to think about that. Uh, shipwreck. What I'm thinking is don't vacation with Paul. That's what I'm thinking. But he was shipwrecked three times. And he said every day. Most of us have had trouble in our lives, but not been in danger every day. Now, I, I was thinking about this as I was writing this sermon. Um, many of you know and love to listen to or read the books of the prosperity gospel preachers, and they're going to tell you God loves you, and he wants you to be rich. He wants you to live in a mansion, and if you will just pray hard enough, he wants to lavish things on you. I'm thinking, you know what? Apparently, the early disciples weren't 
believers enough in the prosperity gospel because they didn't get any of that stuff. Jesus didn't get any of that stuff. He says the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And so I don't get, in fact, it infuriates me every time I hear somebody talk about how much God wants to bless you with material things. And the answer is, no, he doesn't. He doesn't even care about the material things. Jesus said, don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you live. Worry about the more important things, about eternal life. But listen to this. Every day, Paul was in danger from rivers. <laughs> Most of us, we drive over the bridge. We're not in trouble by the rivers, but floodwaters would come. There was always robbers. There were always people. He would travel from place to place. And when he wasn't being shipwrecked, he was being beaten up and robbed. And they probably had to be disappointed. Um, but actually, Paul was one of the first missionaries who would collect money from one church and take it back to Jerusalem where they were under a famine so that the people of God could have food. And so he probably was carrying a great sum of money uh, from time to time, and he was always in danger from the robbers. He was in danger from the wild animals. He said his life was in danger whether he was in the city from people or in the wilderness everywhere he went. There was danger on land. There was danger on the sea. He was imprisoned, listen to this, for preaching Christ. He was in prison at least twice that we know of for several years at a time. It's where he, he basically got the time out so that he could sit down long enough and write some of his letters that we now call a part of our New Testament today. So, beaten three times, whipped five times, stoned, shipwrecked, faced dangers all day long. And, and so, I want you to listen to this man who lived this kind of life, and here's what he had to say, all right? Let's start with uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. And he writes, and we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him. Now, I guarantee you there's somebody here tonight who says, you know what, I can't think of anything good with the trial that I went through or whatever, you know. And, and so it's hard for us to reconcile that he could even use some of the, the hard things, the difficult things in our life to be a part of our growing in faith. But this is what he says. This man who has endured all these things and actually was beheaded when his prison sentence was over. And we're thinking, for What? And he would say, for eternal life, that's what. And in fact, in the previous chapter, he said, ah, eh, all these things, they're light. No big deal. Being bitten, beaten with a whip is no big deal. Being beaten with rods, being stoned, being imprisoned for simply doing what? Preaching about Jesus? No big deal. He goes, ah, light and momentary. And so when he's the same man who writes this, and we know that in all things, everybody say all things. All things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, for those God foreknew, how many did he foreknow? <laughs> all, right? He created everybody, so he, all y'all, that's right. Uh, the, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, um, now, a lot of churches think differently about this passage. I'm a John 3.16 kind of guy. For God so loved the whole world, all y'all. And so who is predestined or what is predestined? And actually, if you get into the Greek, and I don't want to argue with y'all, um, but if you get into the Greek, it actually talks about the way of salvation is what is predestined. And for all those he foreknew, all those that he knew did not cause, but all those who would turn and believe in him, he predestined to be conformed and to the likeness of his son. I've been telling you all for the last few weeks that our goal is not heaven. And you're like, what? I'm out of here. No, our goal is transformation. We are to be conformed to the likeness of his son, capital S, that means Jesus. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What's it talking about here? It's talking about the resurrection. He is the first one born of the new life, of, of the new body, of, of the resurrection. And if he's the firstborn, and if we're in Christ, then we're going to be just like him, so we don't have to worry about our lives. Turn to somebody and say, don't worry about your life. Yeah. <laughs> It's light. It's momentary. It's not a big deal. It's, a, it's no big deal, you know. Eternity is what we're concerned about, all right. So verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. He's building up his case. If you are in Christ, then you are ones who have, to, who have been called. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to wonder what's going to happen after this life. He's, he's done all of these things for you all simply because of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and that alone. Verse 31. And what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, a lot of you can think about somebody who's against you. It might be your husband, <laughs> might be your wife, might be your kids, might be your president, might be anything in this world. And we say, oh, if the world would just do things my way. But he's like, no. He said, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, what Paul's doing is building a case for your eternal life. He's saying, if God's on your side, you don't have to worry about anybody else. You don't have to worry about when you take your last breath on earth, what's going to happen to you. You don't have to be a nervous Nelly. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be afraid. You can be like the disciples who say, "Woohoo! go ahead, beat me, kill me. It doesn't matter because God's on my side. All you can do is kill my body. I'm going to be with the Lord forever. In fact, Paul said, I'm going to preach Christ and him crucified until y'all kill me. And if you kill me, my day doesn't get worse. It actually gets better. Because to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. And man, that's what we're all really looking forward to. Verse 33, so who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So just look up to your right. <laughs> That's your, your left. You're right. There's Jesus. When he ascended, he went up. And sat at the right hand of God. And, and he's the intermediary for us, between us and God. And he's interceding on our behalf. God is for us, not against us, right? All right, so verse 35. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake... We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the, pre the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. So uh, I want to take you back. Some of you guys uh, will remember this. Some of you are way too young and your parents can explain it to you. How many of you remember a movie uh, probably back in the 70s uh, called The Main Event? Three of you. Wow. Maybe some of you will remember. Um, it actually starred Barbara Streisand and who? Good. Ryan O'Neill. And Barbara Streisand, I don't remember what she was, but she was rich and famous and all that kind of stuff. Then she lost everything, and the only thing she owned in this world was one prize fighter. 
And so she invested her whole life into him and making sure that he was doing all the right things. Problem is she knew nothing about prize fighting. She knew nothing about boxers or training. But she was, that was her meal ticket, so she was going to keep her eye on him. So when he went away to training camp, he, she went with them. And the scene that I will never forget is they're eating dinner. Now, these are all rough and tumble guys. These are guys in the fight game. And, and they're just sitting around dinner, and they're having a good old time, and they're talking about their grotesque stories and the gory fights that they've seen. And I'll never forget, this one guy says, yeah, man, you guys should have been there when this guy, he got hit so hard that his lip peeled off like that and it was bothering him because it was flipping all around you know what he did he was some of you are grimacing yep wait, just wait for it all right so it gets worse uh, and, and and so it said the lip was flopping all around and it was driving him crazy you know what he did he was so tough he took that piece of lip and he ripped it off and he threw it out into the ring and everybody's like yeah oh, what a tough guy what a tough so they're all sharing these kind of gory stories and then Barbara Barbara Streisand is trying to get a word in edgewise. Have you ever been somewhere really awkward and like you don't fit in here? And I mean, if you remember, she was wearing her like sweaty leotards and things like that. And they were pink and fluffy and all that kind of stuff. And she was trying to be fit in. She was trying to belong with this guy. And so finally she got their attention and said, I, 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 I remember this one time and it was really bad. I had a paper cut. Right here. And just like you all, who's dead son, it's like, that's it? I mean, we're talking about blood and guts and ripping lips off and throwing them out. And you're talking about a paper cut? A paper cut? Many of us, <laughs> when we are so focused on the things that we're going through, we think it's terrible. And the disciples, the apostles, who faced much worse than we've ever faced before, are going like, really? A paper cut. You got a boo-boo. Don't worry about it. Don't fixate on it. Sometimes we are so sad because our life isn't going the way that we want it to. We can't even get other people to do what we want them to do because we can't do what we want to do ourselves. And so we want to put a higher standard on somebody else, and then we don't do it. We complain about them all day long, and, and my life is just terrible because he won't or she won't or they did. And it's like, wait a minute. You know, the Apostle Paul says, ah, well, you get a paper cut. Compared to what they've been going through, it's not a big deal. But let's pretend that you did not live in the United States. Do you know that there's many countries in the world today? I, I don't know what the latest statistic is, but actually a few years ago they said there were actually more martyrs that year than in the entire history of the world. We who live in America are so protected with our freedoms that we are used to being able to say whatever we want with impunity. We, we don't have to worry about anything because we live in the land of the free. But the, most of the rest of the world are living under uh, uh, not free. They are living in places that if you talk about Christianity, you can still lose your life today. And so even if we were going through that, even if we were afraid every single day of our life, if we faced dangers all day long, the Apostle Paul says, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Whatever happens to you, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your body. Don't worry about your cars. Don't worry about your IRAs. You know what? It's not a big deal. What you need to be celebrating is your relationship with our Heavenly Father because if God is for us, who can be against us? Can I get an amen? amen? So let's take a look at some of these things. So verse 28, all things work together for good. Nobody likes to go through hard times, but do you not know? And if you're honest with yourself, when you have been going through a hard time, and I've been through those hard times, and, and it was my experience, is that when I came up against something that I couldn't do anything about, I had no place else to go but God. 
And we stand here today on the other side of that challenge and that trial. And I want to tell you, our faith is even deeper than if we had never gone through it before. It's confusing for many people that as soon as Jesus is baptized and heavens open up and the dove comes down and, and a voice from heaven says, this is my son with whom I will please. Listen to him. And immediately the Holy Spirit drove him out in the desert to be tested. And we're like, what? Aren't we, everything supposed to be okay once we become Christians? No. Sometimes it gets harder because the world doesn't understand us. And yet, what we do when we go through these hard times, when we go through these trials, when we go through persecution and we turn to the one who is eternal, then we can say, God, I lay my life down. It doesn't matter. I want to be with you forever and ever and ever. Help me walk through this. And he can take those things, the bad things, the difficult things, and turn them together for good. All things work together for good for them, those who love the Lord. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who's bigger, smarter, more powerful than God? The answer is no one. God is God. He's the God of the universe. We don't have to worry about anybody else or what they say to us or even what they think they can do to us because they're not in charge of you and me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, and at the end of our lives, um, we are told that as soon as we leave this life, we will be judged. And everybody goes, <gasps> now, judging doesn't always have to be in a negative connotation. It means, well done, good and faithful servant. I have judged you worthy. Come on in. So it might be a good thing. But some of us have those secret doubts. Am I good enough? Have I done the right things? And, and what's it going to be when I, when I stand in front of Jesus? I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going down. That's what I'm doing. He's holy. We like to throw his name about like we're best buddies or friends. But I'm telling you, when you stand face to face with the Son of God, you will realize what holy is. He is holy. He is worthy. And yet, for those who have dedicated their lives to him, who put their faith and trust, it says that he will reach down and he will lift us up. He is the one who is interceding on our behalf that we could be invited, ushered in, adopted by our Heavenly Father and be with him forever and ever and ever. So verse 32 says, so who can bring a charge against us? Is there anybody who can be in the heavenly court? Now, an earthly court, there's probably somebody knows you better than you even know yourself. They know where all the skeletons are hidden, and they're like, don't get above your raisins. Don't forget who you were. Don't remember. Don't forget that I remember. You may not remember, but I remember. And I know you're not all that in a bag of chips. I know that you've messed up. I know that you're imperfect. I know all these things about you. And so we have this concern or worry, like what have I even forgotten about that God's going to bring up? And he says, well, hey, who can bring a charge to, against us? Who, since God, the author and creator of the universe, is for us, who can stand against us? So the good news for today, for those in Christ, we are more than conquerors. <laughs> if you don't know the story of Gideon, look it up. Some of you don't feel like mighty warriors. An angel came to Gideon and said, greetings, mighty warrior. And while he was not kneed and hiding underground from the other uh, opposing army, and he's like, who, me? Some of you may not feel like conquerors, but I want you to feel like conquerors today. I want you to know when God is on your side, no one can be against you. We who are more than conquerors, for Paul who faced death every day, we have nothing to fear because no thing will ever separate us from the love of God. We started this series about seven weeks ago now from a pastor's heart because it's my heart to you. But it's also the Apostle Paul, his pastoral heart to all those who would be reading these letters generations later that they might be strengthened, that they might be encouraged, that they might know. One of our favorite heroes in the Methodist church is John Wesley. Had the opportunity to go there uh, some years ago to London and we traveled around England and got to see all the places where he was born, where he lived, and even where he died. 
Uh, he died in London in his home, in his own bed. At the last words, <laughs> I hope I get in the last word. It, John Wesley got in the last word, and he said, best of all, God is with us. He closed his eyes, and he died. He left us with that good news and that understanding that, best of all, God is with us. So what do we do with this information? I want you to think about whatever you're going through, whatever pain you've been through, whatever suffering, that it is only temporary. Put that pain in proper perspective. For everything that Paul went through, most of us, it was light and momentary. Every struggle uh, actually serves to strengthen our faith as we learn to rely on the Lord. But best of all, we know that you're not going through, uh, whatever you're going through, nothing. Say nothing. Nothing. No thing. Nothing here. No heights or debts or power or angels or demons or principalities. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. That's good news for today. Amen? Amen. So whatever you believe about tomorrow affects how you think, act, believe, and behave today. So let's lift up uh, some of these things into the Lord as we pray.